Welcome to Raising a Glass. Uh, my name is Laura Green. I am the Spirit Specialist for Wine Boat in the Midwest. Um, we also have Dan Searing, who is the Spirit Specialist for Mid-Atlantic. Did I nail it? With DC, Delaware, yeah. Um, and then we have three lovely human beings from Jay Rieger and Co. A few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, welcome to Zoom. If this is your first time on Zoom, um, if you look to the bottom of your screen, if you're on your computer, um, you will see that there is an area for a chat and an area for a Q&A. If you have a question, go ahead and put that question in the Q&A. If you have just comments and general banter or like, hello from Singapore, throw that in the chat. Um, yeah, so that's that. And that just really helps us. Nathan, I'm going to mute you just because I can hear things. Um, that really helps us to make sure rock. Make sure that we don't miss questions um, and that everything is addressed appropriately. Hello from Chicagoland, 100%. Me too. Um, also, just to like throw it out there, I'm not seeing anybody I don't know right now, but if anyone pops on and there's any sort of like gnarly words thrown in or like hate speech or general trolling, we are going to kick you out. That's why Dan is here. He is our virtual bouncer of today. And awesome. yeah, cool. So this should last about an hour. I'm really excited to have all of you from Jay Rieger. Do you want to introduce yourselves, starting with Ryan? Sure. Um, I'm Ryan Maybe. I am one of the co-founders of Jay Rieger and & Company and the VP of Sales and Hospitality. Cool. Oh, okay. I thought you were gonna keep going, but that, that's cool. We got. Oh, you. I thought you just want me to introduce myself. Well, we'll, we'll get whatever. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. All right, Nathan, talk to us. Okay, so I'm Nathan Perry. I'm the head distiller. I'm actually on the production floor. That's why I've got the mask on. We've got people walking around. So I'm, I will be like this for the entire time. Uh, we are. We're currently in the middle of trying to still make everything we normally make. Then also, uh, I'm distilling a bunch of ethanol for hand sanitizer as well. So I'm actually currently doing that as we do this. So, cool, yeah. awesome. And Ryan, maybe too. Erica Schulte. Oh, this is Ryan, maybe you can change that too if you want. Okay, um, I am Erica Schulte, and I am the national brand manager. Cool, awesome. And so I have a lovely wall behind me. It is a little, are you up in that conference room? I am in the boardroom. Board room. The board room. It's a map of Kansas City. It's pretty dope. I like it. Just in case, um, in case we forget where we are when we're in the boardroom, the map is right there on the wall behind us. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yes, Monique, social distancing, <laughs> distancing at its finest. <laughs> cool. Well, Ryan, you have a deck to share with us with some photos. I was hoping maybe you could just go ahead and jump in, talk a little bit about Rieger's history. I know today we're especially honing in on Rieger's current situation as well as the whiskey and the gin. So I'll hand it over to you to share your screen. Sure. It's all ready to go. So what I thought we, we could do today, since uh, probably a lot of you have, have already been pretty familiarized with uh, our company and our products and everything, thought I'd give you more of a, an update and an inside look into uh, what we're doing right now uh, at the distillery. And so I'll load to that story and then get back into the, the products and uh, taste, uh, taste the gin and the whiskey and let Nathan talk about production and probably give you a little virtual tour of the uh, production floor uh, where he is right now. But I'll start with, uh, let me try and, that was Moose. So <laughs> Everything's fine. Um, he does that every now and then. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was Moose. Um, at, some, <laughs> at some point, he is going to Zoom bomb us as well. He's going to show up, like, right here. Yeah. <laughs> the only reason we're doing this, let's be real. All right, buddy, come here. you got to calm down, all right? Um, He's actually the true host. Let me introduce, let me introduce host. real quick. Come here. See? There's the, there he is. All right. <laughs> all right. So... <laughs> That's uh, my Doberman's running. This is hilarious. All right, I'm going to try and figure out this share screen thing, and then we'll we'll go from there. We'll be off and running. Hang on. 
that's the one. Moose is actually going to taste some gin and whiskey too. Mm -hmm. I've had, I've drank a lot of whiskey with Moose once. I was like, He's a whiskey oh, dog. and he was like, no. <laughs> I was like, why? Can you guys see the, the slideshow? Yeah, you, if you go into the presentation one, it takes over the full screen though. Awesome. Yeah. How's that? Perfect. This is very cool. great. And for those of you at home, you can make the, you can keep watching the panelists. So if you want to watch Ryan talk or me watch or whatever you can, you have at the top of your little screen though, little um, segments that you can take it down to nothing. So you can see the full screen and just listen. I mean, you do you, but you know, whatever. You do you. You do you. you, do you. All righty. Okay. So I'm going to start with just a real brief recap of our history. Um, won't get into so much detail, but uh, as a refresher, um, Jay Rieger and Company was founded in 1887 in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, in a neighborhood that's now known as the West Bottoms, which is uh, the river bottoms right along the banks of the Missouri River. Um, and also that's right where Missouri and Kansas uh, collide. And there's the border between the two states. Uh, we're actually on the Missouri side. Uh, we were on the Missouri side back then as well. Um, due to uh, prohibition being enacted in the state of Kansas all the way back in 1881, a full 38 years prior to federal prohibition, Kansas went dry. Nobody really cared because everyone just went across the street, literally, to the Missouri side. And that whole area of Kansas City, Missouri uh, just exploded with bars and saloons and uh, brothels and casinos and uh, a distillery. And so this is our distillery. The gentleman there in the middle, the one with the mustache and the really cool hat, uh, that is Alexander Rieger. That is the son of the founder, Jacob Rieger. He took over operations of the distillery in 1900 and really uh, elevated J. Rieger and Company to the next level. You'll see the, the letterhead there at the bottom uh, it says largest wholesale mail order whiskey house in the United States. It was something that they were very proud of. Uh, back then, we would ship uh, products all around uh, the U.S. right to, to people's front door. Um, this one is a photo of one of the best uh, kept uh, old bottles from back then uh, of all of our monogram whiskey. You see, you see the shield, um, the Rieger's font, uh, everything. We tried to resurrect the brand as much as we possibly could and be very true to that original packaging and branding. You see the uh, arch on the top of the bottle and everything. We replicated that to the best of our ability. And then on the right is an actual shot glass that we, uh, we would give away back then. Uh, with our brand on it and the slogan, Oh So Good, um, which uh, we've re resurrected that as well and use that as part of our uh, marketing and, and advertising and have it on all of our, uh, all of our bottles. Um, this is an example of uh, how we would sell back then. So basically what we would do is we'd put these, these ads in newspapers all around the country from coast to coast. And uh, you can see the prices on there, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, four quarts of extra fine whiskey for $3, one quart of 1888 brand for a buck 50. Uh, basically you're looking at eight bottles for a total of $7 and 25 cents, or actually $5 and 45 cents uh, if you buy in bulk. And then uh, people would mail that cash to our uh, distillery here in KC. And then we would ship uh, these bottles to their front door. Uh, we can't do that anymore. Um, but a few years ago, a uh, quick little side note, um, one of the lovely sales managers for Winebow actually uh, put $6 in cash in an envelope and mailed it with a printed out copy of this ad to us and asked to have it delivered to his front door. I thought that was very clever of him. Um, a lot of fun. I'm sure Laura knows who that was. Don't know. Yeah, you do. Oh, no, I great. Don't. Oh. <laughs> Um, that was Damon. That was Damon Dyer. Um, so this is today, you know, we, J. Rieger and company went out of business in 1919 with prohibition. Uh, we shut down and was never heard from for another 95 years. Um, I discovered the history of the brand back in 2010. Uh, when I had my bar and restaurant at the, the Rieger Hotel, I discovered the history of the whiskey brand. And then I met Andy Rieger, who is the great, great, great grandson of the founder um, and a direct descendant of Jacob and, and Alexander. And then he and I started talking about resurrecting the company and finally brought it back in uh, 2014. So this picture is actually the location where we are today. The original distillery was torn down probably in like the 1940s or so. 
this is actually a brewery that was about as big, if not bigger than Jay Rieger and Company back then in Kansas City called Heim. Uh, they were a, a really uh, huge nationally distributed uh, beer brand uh, out of KC. They specialized in German lagers. And that building that's just on the left side of the screen, you see it's two stories. That's the building that we're located in today. That was their bottling facility. They owned this whole uh, complex here. It was a brewery. They had an amusement park. They had their own uh, streetcar line that went straight down there. And then they had this building over here in the, the left corner uh, was their bottling facility. Now, the there were uh, tunnels underground that are still there today that connect the bottling facility to the original brewery. Um, where the beer was transported underground and they were maintenance tunnels and really neat operation, uh, pretty, pretty fantastic. So that's the building, that is uh, the building we're in today, but that photo was taken back in uh, uh, the early 1900s, probably uh, before 1910, uh, when it was relatively uh, new. This picture was taken of the same building from the same perspective um, after Prohibition, you'll notice the sign on the, the building says Abner Hood Chemical Company. So after Heim went out of business with Prohibition, uh, it became a chemical uh, production and supply company uh, for a couple of decades. Finally, it eventually fell into disrepair. And this is the way that we found the building back in 2014. Windows were boarded up. There was nothing going on inside. It was completely abandoned. And we were actually renting uh, a little warehouse just to the north of this, it's connected to it. And we started our operation in that little warehouse with the hopes of one day uh, purchasing this building and expanding uh, into this building. And that happened a, a little bit faster than we thought it would. We actually an, ended up buying the building in 2017 and uh, uh, remodeled it and reopened it just this past summer uh, in July of, of last year. So when we first started, we didn't have a bar, tasting room, tours, anything like that. We were literally focused on production. We were making our whiskey, vodka, gin, the Cafe Amaro, and getting it out the door and getting it into liquor stores and bars and restaurants around the country and trying to build the brand that way. We were not really focused on a, a guest experience at our distillery, but this expansion allowed us to do that. So uh, when we started to remodel this building, the, the whole idea was to not only expand the production output, which we did significantly, um, but also add that consumer element to it as well with daily tours, multiple bars, event spaces, uh, the whole thing. So I'm going to take you a little bit of a kind of a guided tour um, around that transition. This is the building today. Uh, we opened in July of last year, added some really cool signage, uh, painted our name on it, um, built a crosswalk there, pretty up quite a bit. Um, really beautiful, beautiful building. Um, some signage right at the entry. Um, Laura's been there. Some of you have been there. Monique's been there. This is uh, one of my favorite pictures. So this is uh, the best interior shot that we have of the production floor back when it was functioning as the Heim Brewery. So you'll notice the bot it was all bottling. So everything is coming in underground, uh, barrels, bottles, uh, pipes of beer, and then everything was getting bottled right along these conveyors here. And then at the top of the screen on the, on the north end of the, the building uh, is a loading dock that would go right onto railroad cars and then get shipped uh, around the country. And so from taken from that perspective from the second floor, I'm gonna show you what it looks like today. That is our, our production floor today since we uh, have remodeled it and reopened it. Uh, another perspective right here. Um, it's very pretty. One thing, actually, I don't know if I can go back. I'm going to show you. Yeah, this is really cool. Take a close look at the banister uh, wrapping around the second floor and look at the design of it. When we uh, remodeled and, and built the production floor right in the center, we had to enclose everything in glass. It couldn't be open uh, like that. Um, so the banister was no longer there and uh, we wanted to replicate it. So you'll notice that we etched it into the glass uh, surrounding the production floor, which is kind of a nice little artistic touch. And then that second floor up there, that's our event space. And you'll notice if you look just past the still, the column there, you'll see some draft towers. That's uh, our main bar called the Monogram Lounge, um, where we uh, used to host a lot of people every day. <laughs> um, this picture is really cool too. This is from uh, obviously back when it was Heimbury, uh, some gentlemen that were uh, bottling beer. They're obviously thrilled. Um, and then this is the first floor as the building was when we found it. And from that same uh, point of view, this is what it looks like today. So when you enter, this is the front 
uh, front door, you walk in, we have a front desk. Uh, you can see through the glass windows, you can see the production floor with the stills right behind it. Over to the left, you have our uh, little retail shop, little gift shop. Um, this part is uh, the other side of that same room on the first floor. It used to be uh, Nathan's gym. Um, I don't know where Nathan went, um, but Nathan had his motorcycle there and uh, had his workout equipment there. And, um, you know, that's, uh, I don't know how much he actually used it. This is what it looks like today. We turned that uh, area into a 4,000 square foot uh, museum, a uh, historic exhibit, talking about our story, talking about the history of Jay Rieger and company, talking about Haim, uh, their impact on Kansas City, talking about prohibition and how that put uh, both families out of business and how much of, a, of an economic impact it had on our companies as well as the city. And then also talking about the resurrection of it, how Andy and I met, uh, Manifesto, my bar, the Rieger, and uh, that whole thing. So we've got a really, a lot of really cool old artifacts, old bottles, uh, newspaper clippings, uh, all kinds of really fun stuff. It's a, it's a great, great bit of a history to walk through and take a look at um, right there on the, on the first floor. Uh, this is the other corner of the first floor when we uh, first found it, which now today looks like this. Uh, we built that stairwell. We opened up the, the floor above it and built that stairwell to go up to the monogram lounge. So if you come in and you want to hang out at the, at the main bar of the monogram lounge, you go up these stairs here. Um, and then to come back downstairs, you have to take the slide. Uh, we've got, built a 40-foot uh, tornado uh, slide, as you can see, someone moving really, really fast. Um, Laura, how many times did you take the slide when you were when you were down there? A lot of times, and I had a dress that was very slick, like it was very packable and not wrinkly able. So I would just like whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> yeah, you were. I thought I was. I thought I was going to go off the side. You were. You were moving. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. So when you go to the second floor, this is what the second floor was before we started construction, and this is it today. That is the monogram lounge. Uh, that room can uh, accommodate up to uh, just shy of 400 people. Uh, we would do private events. Um, we can divide it up in different ways. And behind that, we've got our offices and our boardroom where Erica is sitting uh, right now. This is our tasting room on the first floor. So if you take a tour, you'll walk through production. You'll see our barrel house. Um, and then you'll end up in the tasting room where you get to uh, taste through all our spirits. And then uh, we also would rent this out for uh, private events as well. And then in the basement, we have the Hey Hey Club, which is another bar. Uh, this one, obviously much more cozy and intimate, focused on uh, cocktails and uh, really elegant uh, setting that pays tribute to a historic jazz nightclub in Kansas City. Uh, the Hey Hey Club was actually uh, a famous place in KC back in the 30s and 40s. It was home to Count Basie. He was the big band leader there. And uh, we wanted to resurrect uh, that history and that part, of, uh, that part of Kansas City as well. We've actually turned this in. Currently, this is a film studio. Uh, we have added some professional lighting and everything. We've been doing all kinds of uh, videos and uh, live, uh, live uh, happy hours and cocktail instruction, all kinds of stuff. Uh, looking forward to getting it back to uh, an actual bar. Um, second floor, this is our offices, how they were, offices today. So we put a lot of work into it, did a lot of really cool things. Um, amazingly, we got all that done in about a, about a year. The construction took less than a year and we opened and it was, it was probably too fast. It was really, really crazy, to be honest. Um, we opened in July of last year. And in doing so, we also expanded our company significantly. You know, for the first four years or so that we were in business, we grew from just me and Andy starting out to having Nathan, our, our first employee, uh, started uh, in January of 15. And then by, uh, you know, like four years in, we had a, all of about a dozen or so employees, uh, including Erica. And then um, in opening this, all of a sudden we're adding bartenders and servers and tour guides and retail workers and kitchen employees. And we grew to over 80 uh, employees uh, in that process overnight. It was quite a, quite a shift. And then, so now what I wanna talk about is like how we've handled uh, what's happened in the last couple of months and what we've done to keep all of them employed because we have kept our entire staff uh, uh, employed and with health insurance and uh, it's not been easy, but uh, it's been a pretty amazing couple of months the way this has all gone down. Um, we are now a uh, full-time hand sanitizer factory. We are making Rieger's Remedy hand sanitizer. And we're cranking out uh, thousands of bottles every day. We're doing two liter bottles and little six ounce bottles as well. 
these are totes uh, that we uh, received ethanol in. Um, we're going through a lot of it. Um, this is production, part of the production on the hand sanitizer front. I think the picture on the left there is uh, the addition of the glycerin. I think if, if I'm wrong, Nathan will correct me. Um, right. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, and then you, you see the stills and uh, uh, the tanks there on the, on the right. Um, that's Nathan Perry. Nathan, what do you want to say about this? I'm actually sitting in that same chair right now <laughs> as we do this, uh, but it looks like I'm doing nothing, but I'm doing things. I'm observing two different stills at that time. It just looks like I'm relaxing, but I'm not. It's a great I'm chair, looking. by the way. It is, it's a, I'm, that's why I'm sitting here right now. <laughs> I think we built, built that chair out of a, a barrel. Maybe Jay, Jay did, the assistant distiller. Did Jay build that? No. Uh, Craftsman in Southern Missouri built it. Okay. It's great. Um, there's another shot of our production floor. The circular staircase there goes up to our offices um, and overlooks the production floor. Um, in making the sanitizer, um, you know, what we had to do was, it's all manual, you know, we, we never foresaw this being an, an, uh, you know, a necessity or something we would have to do. Uh, so we really had to act quickly to make this a, a thing that would be viable for our company. And so what that meant was with the, the bars and everything closing, uh, all of our, our bartenders, our servers, kitchen workers, tour guides, they're the ones that are working on the production line every day. They're the ones that are filling the bottles and labeling the bottles and packaging everything out and getting it out there. And so it's quite a, quite an operation. And as hard as it's been, it's also been really, really crazy rewarding. Um, that's Andy Rieger, um, business partner, doing his thing. Uh, another picture of some bottles. And those are the little guys. Those are, well, we actually, uh, we're using a different one now. We're, we have a six ounce bottle that's about, about that size, maybe a little bit bigger. That is Emily. She is the uh, one coordinating our, basically all the uh, orders that come in. We, we were taking in orders online um, for companies. We've been, we've donated probably 25% of our total production to essential services like hospitals and first responders. We've outfitted the entire bus system in Kansas City. We've been shipping all over the country. Uh, that part alone is, has uh, required a lot of uh, logistics and, and efforts to keep it all, keep it all organized. And there we are loading up someone's someone's truck. Um, that I believe is the end of that. Um, any questions about the the hand sanitizer stuff before we get into like back into the booze and all that? Yes, Ryan. Um, Monique wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about the steps of production of the hand sanitizer for folks who aren't familiar with the process. Actually, I'll I'll let Nathan. I mean, I can, but since we've yeah. got Nathan here, I'd prefer that he yeah, did that. He can also show you guys. He can also show you guys the production floor to some extent. Great. Yeah, I can try to walk fantastic. around. I don't know. Do I have the screen? Are you guys looking at me? Tell you what, I will. How about I stop sharing for now? Yeah. Are you looking at me now? Yeah. Yes, I'm gonna pin you too. I don't know what that means. I'm not this sure. This is my first time doing a Zoom call. Uh, my kids do Zoom like classroom all the time, so I feel like I'm just now catching up with the last two months of America it's and doing like a Zoom TikTok. call. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually going to dance a little bit later. Uh, so uh, basically, what we're allowed to do, uh, so the WHO uh, ha has a formulation for hand sanitizer, and it's called like a, it's an antiseptic hand rub, is the technical way we're looking at it. And the FDA uh, has allowed, uh, during the uh, pandemic, uh, has allowed uh, an, this exemption. Uh, so anybody can really make it. Uh, so distilleries, we can make this or other plants can make it. And so we have a very specific formula we have to follow. So we have to take, what we have is it's a, it's a corn based ethanol. So all we're doing is we're distilling it up to 190 proof at least. Um, and then uh, we're gonna add a little bit of glycerin. Um, and we actually add a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. And the reason we add that hydrogen peroxide is just in case there are any spores of any bacteria that would happen to be around that will actually help deactivate those spores so we'll actually we combine all those at a uh it's a alcohol percentage of uh, 80 percent uh, 160 proof um, and then we will package that let it sit for a little while let the hydrogen peroxide work and then we'll send it out that's kind of the basics of it but we're, we're currently operating under this exemption uh through the fda they're allowing us to make it so what i've got going on right now 
I can't see myself. I've got one that's still here. I'm doing a final distillation of the, uh, the corn-based ethanol. And that's to kind of clean it up a little bit um, in a fermentation as you concentrate things down. Uh, you're going to end up with some compounds uh, that at a higher concentration can be a little bit harmful. So uh, this final distillation allows us to make some heads and tails cuts and we can get rid of those um, and make it to where it's something that you can rub in your hands and kill a virus, bacteria, and, and whatnot. So uh, that's, a, that's a pretty quick description of what we're doing. Uh, if anyone has more specific questions, I can answer those. But uh, one, one question we get all the time is why we don't add uh, – why, why do we don't add a smell? Like our gin smells great, but like why don't we make the hand sanitizer smell great? Because we could, it, it, like it really would be easy for us to do. And in my opinion, I don't think it would, it would uh, affect the uh, uh, efficacy of, of the product. But uh, one thing the FDA is worried about, and I can get behind this, is they don't want kids drinking it. That's a big deal. You don't want kids, you don't want, the, with, with the amount of hand sanitizer that is now, out and around, uh, they want to make sure that uh, that's not a problem because they've already seen spikes in this, and we we get stuff every day in our guidance from them. And so, what we actually add in, and I forgot to mention, uh, we add in this bittering agent, which is exceedingly, it, it's insanely bitter. It, it, I mean, it's it takes uh, 20 milliliters will make a thousand gallons really, really bitter. So we add that in, uh, so kids don't drink the hand sanitizer, but. Um, that's also a reason why we can't make it smell better. Uh, we, we, we wish, I mean, honestly, I wish I could take some citrus peels and throw it in there and just make it just a little bit more approachable, but I understand the justification of why we can't do that. So that's what, that's a question we get all the time and one I wanted to address. So that's all I got on the hand sanitizer. And to be clear, it's not like Tide Pods, kids eating Tide Pods because they're like, they seem appetizing and look like candy, like they're actually trying to get messed up on the alcohol. That's why kids are drinking it. Oh, no, I mean, I think it's actually young kids. It's, I, I oh, think it's baby. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's little kids. It's accidental ingestion. You could drink it. Like, honestly, there's nothing toxic about the hand sanitizer. I, I, I jokingly uh, tasted it. He's not advocating to go drink it. <laughs> no. No, but I've actually Please. seen him do PRP. it, unfortunately. <laughs> the thing is, if you wanted to, you could. That, I mean, it, for us, it was important to make sure it was all non-toxic, but it's, a, it's very unappealing. You don't want to drink it. And that's, that's the whole thing. I mean, any adult would be able to, like, if you really want to taste it, go for it. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't taste good. It's really bad. So um, yeah, you want to avoid drinking that. We, we make other things that taste much better than our hand sanitizer. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a nice segue. Let's talk about yeah. <laughs> delicious to drink. <laughs> Will you show everybody, Nathan, real quickly, the pro the production line, the bottling line? Oh, show uh, everybody yeah. what we've How done. Do I, can I switch my camera? Does anyone you know can, how to do this? I don't think you can. You're just going to have to, it's going to have to be a selfie. Okay. Well, here, I'll go over. Let's see, Andrew Olson here, bartender extraordinaire. Hey, buddy. This is Zoom call with wine buff. Uh, so this is where our this is uh, where we're actually bottling the hand sanitizer. So we actually have uh, some hoses going off here uh, with some tables set up, uh, kind of be able to set it around. Uh, we we've got it where everyone's wearing a mask, everyone's trying to be as safe as possible, but also we're trying to in all this like like Ryan said, trying to employ as many people as possible. So with our normal bottle line, which is oh, I'm gonna go ahead and sorry. I'm gonna go over here. This is our normal bottle line. This is where we bottle all the uh, all the gin, all the vodka, all the whiskey. Uh, it's really efficient. It takes three people, and we can knock out, you know, a thousand bottles in an hour. Like it, for us, it's pretty. It's really efficient. Um, whereas this is actually not all that efficient, but it does allow us to employ people, and that was one of our big goals in all of this. Is like we want to make sure we keep people employed. Um, and so we wanted to design where we could do it safely, uh, so we can safely package all this, uh, but also uh, keep as many people as employed as possible. So if we wanted to, like a, a large company uh, doing this, you could do it a lot more automated and you could be a lot more efficient than what we're doing, but that wasn't the point for us necessarily. We wanted to make sure we made hand sanitizer that we knew was effective, but that also we were allow allowing us to employ uh, our entire staff. So. Well, and we actually have like tripled labor 
because yeah. of sanitizer production, which is pretty astronomical. Well, that makes sense because you're not accounting in for like your front of house staff. We would usually be taking in tips. Um, people are, uh, Ryan, you had mentioned to me before that people are being paid what they would fully make in a normal week, right? Yeah, no, everyone's getting a, a very, they got a significant raise, uh, an hourly raise by a lot, you know, to hopefully, you know, make up for that and, and make sure that they're, they're taken care of because they're and, not and getting tips. You know, in a time where most people, a lot of people, especially in, you know, small, or still growing distilleries like yourself are furloughed and. Right. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to lie about it. it. It was, we were very close to that. I mean, oh it was, God. you know, Andy and Joe and Lucy and I were sitting in, in, in the office, like in tears thinking this is what we're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. And it was gut wrenching, but fortunately this, this shift to a hand sanitizer has allowed us to, to not have to let anyone go. It's amazing. So let's switch, like Nathan, since we have you on the floor, I think it might be a fun opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the gin and the whiskey in particular. Sure. While, like we kind of tag team between tasting notes and application and production at the same time. Like, sure. you know, I know like with my teams here in the Midwest, we talk a lot about the influence of production with how that results in um, you know, flavor profiles and how to use it and everything. So I think this is a really neat opportunity to hit them both at the same time. Okay. So right. listen up, Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, let me, uh, I just finished up uh, a gin distillation. So, cool. to, so this is my gin still. So this is the gin still that Tom and I designed um, after uh, using our old gin still is this guy. So this is the one we used for the first three years, four years. Uh, and then Tom and I kind of uh, drew out this gin still. But the way, I feel like someone's about to walk in here and get loud. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Mm -hmm. um, You're good. So actually, I'm going I'm to hop up here. And I can kind of show you. I don't know if any of this is going to come through. Um, You're working. Looks great. Okay. So the way we, it, it actually doesn't matter if you see my face because you can't see my face anyway. I might as well just talk. So um, the way we distill is actually we're going to take everything. This is a 500 gallon uh, uh, fully copper uh, pot still. Uh, we're going to put everything in the pot. This is so, so awkward. I'm, I apologize. Um, and then I, I actually want to open this up so you guys can see because I still have botanicals in here from the distillation I did today. So maybe you'll be able to see or... Oh, it's steaming. Yeah, you can't see anything there. No. It's, yeah, it's a little, oh. a little steamy. Um, so it's just a little warm. What way we do it, we take all the ethanol, um, all of, it's a wheat base, GNS, uh, and then we take a little bit of water, and then we'll take our uh, uh, gin botanicals, and we'll take those, and we'll put those all in the pot. And so you'll notice in this, that's just an onion right here. It kind of tapers up in between those two flanges up there at the top. Is a little heat exchanger that allows it to condense a little, but there's no gin basket. So we don't do um, any vapor distillation or anything like that. And so uh, that's something you'll see in some other dis distilleries, but we don't. Uh, that's something that Tom, Tom always, he made a joke about it, but it was like making a cup of tea, but then like just waving the tea bag over the top of the cup. I think Tom gets to say that because um, he uh, has a lot more experience than I. So I just, I tag along and I give him credit for that comment. Uh, but I know what, what, with the skills that he gave me and how to distill uh, utilizing botanicals in the actual maceration process by putting them in, just directly in there, uh, it allows us to get all the flavor that we want out of it. Uh, and we have a lot of control and it allows them kind of, kind of meld together. That was the whole thing, the reasoning. So the, this is a little awkward. So the level of liquid sits probably right about there when we first start. So that means everything above here and going up there is all vapor. And so what's happening in that is you're getting some interaction in the vapor. Uh, you're also getting interaction with the copper. And so that kind of helps with the mouthfeel of the gin. Um, it allows it to kind of, uh, the different uh, botanicals to kind of interact, which sounds a little bit like bullshit, but 
I've done individual botanical distillations and I've noticed there is a difference when you distill them all together uh, as opposed to separately. And so I like I'm I'm adamant that like like distilling them together, you're gonna get more from other. And so uh, the, the like uh, what's the the saying? The the sum is greater than the whole, or the 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 something to that effect. But yes, you, they they do interact in a way that actually kind of helps them uh, become what is a better product. So, and that makes sense because like when you're if if you were to like mix a cocktail and let it like sit for about or even better example would be like soup. When you let soup sit for a day and you come back and all those flavors have melded together really beautifully. I imagine that's kind of similar to distilling them all together because they're all cooking together and reacting off of each other at the same time. Yeah. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And also, when, like, go ahead, please. Oh, no. It's like, and also post distillation, like it goes into a little tank there that can hold uh, the entire uh, distillation for one day. But we have a larger tank that sits next door that we will pump into, and it will sit in there and kind of store. And uh, Tom always likes to say he wants to let the gin rest for a fortnight. When then I tell him, it's like, no one knows what a fortnight means uh, in the United States, Tom. Um, and he was incredulous about that. But uh, so honestly, bet, best case, you know, let, let it rest for a couple of weeks. And, you know, I don't, like, I feel like I, I can taste a difference. Um, if it's placebo effect, fine. But if it, like, I really do feel like it allows things to meld. But like, kind of like you said, like, that soup or uh, even leftover lasagna, mm -hmm. as you know, the flavors melt, things happen. Like, uh, and so uh, it allows it just to be a little bit better version of what it was, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So for my, for my Midwest teams um, watching right now, we've talked a lot about in gin production that you have main ways of imparting those botanical sets in there through, you know, either including the botanicals in the distillation by vapor, like having vapor pass through the botanicals and it picks it up that way, or post distillation compounding, um, or pre, or I guess mid pre distillation maceration that you macerate it and then you re distill it. So, so that we're clear as we watch this, this is all distillation bot botanical implicate. Im Correct. Yeah. So this would be a yeah. distilled gin. Yeah. Like by style, what we were trying to mimic uh, is a London dry gin. Right. We call it we call it Midwestern dry because we're in the Midwest, but we made that up. I mean, that's not a thing. It's not a category. Um, and honestly, in America, gin is it, it seems like it's less protected than in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're a little more serious because there are a lot of gins. They don't. You're not required, like you say, like a compound gin. Uh, you're not required to actually say that on the label. So there are tons out there that is just grain neutral spirit with flavorings or essences, as Tom would say, uh, added after, and, and then just packaged. And you, you, the way you can tell, I mean, some you're gonna tell by mouthfeel, mm -hmm. but obviously like you could, I mean, I, uh, I'm getting really nerdy, but uh, there was a, uh, there's a college that actually reached out to me locally and they wanted to know why some gins had sugar in them. Um, and I was like, well, no, uh, they, and they wanted to use our gin as a base on how much sugar we had in our gin. I was like, we don't have any sugar in our gin. Was like, well, no, we've run some tests on uh, HPLC, which is high performance liquid chromatography, but it's a way to separate out all the things that are in uh, a liquid. Um, and they found sugar in a few gins. And I was like, the reason they have sugar in it is because they've added it post distillation. And maybe they, that was like a vehicle in one of their, uh, in one of the flavorings that they were using. But it's a brand that you guys, you guys have definitely seen on the shelf, uh, and they don't say it. They don't say that that is the thing that they're adding in. But uh, uh, I gave them a sample of ours, and we don't have sugar in ours. Uh, but that's why we use licorice root, is to actually kind of add a little of that sweetness. Um, and then the copper contact helps a lot with the mouthfeel. And so you, there, there are a couple ways that you can do some certain things. One does it in a better way and rounds it out better. Um, this is, I would say, in my opinion, and I think in Tom's opinion, but, uh, or you can try to cheat and get around it and by adding maybe a little bit of sugar um, and then just add flavors at the end. But it's, it's not as cohesive. It's just not, it doesn't make the, doesn't make it as good of a gin, so. So then the result of all of that with your gin is a really balanced and versatile London Dry style, but quite authentically London Dry in production gin that can be mixed into uh, Tom Collins, a martini. It, 
it mixes seamlessly with most every aromatized wine I've ever used with it, which is really exciting. Yeah, that was a big goal of ours, I think. And Ryan, maybe Ryan could talk a little bit to that too, but uh, we all, it, there are so many, there are a lot, even a lot of very, and I would say beautifully distilled or beautifully produced gins mm -hmm. out there that maybe have too specific of a flavor profile for me. And I would just be like, I have a lot of strong opinions and I try to tone them down when I'm talking to a bunch of people. Uh, but uh, I think one of the beautiful things about our gin, one of the goals that we had was to let it be a vehicle for the bartender or the home bartender or somebody like that, where if you like a Negroni, you can make a kick-ass Negroni. You want a gin and tonic? Oh yeah, it's gonna work here. Whereas there are some gins, you get really specific with your flavors or you, you try to add more or try to do too much. Um, and you're gonna end up with something where it's very difficult to make all like a lot of the classic cocktails. It's too specific of a flavor. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't, we haven't mentioned, but we have five botanicals. We have uh, juniper, we have coriander, we have angelica root, we have licorice root and orange peel. So those are the five that we have in our in our gin. And one of the, the rules of thumb Tom always tells me is even in like uh, done some other kind of playing around or anytime I'm thinking about a new recipe, he's like, if you get more than eight ingredients you're trying too hard you're trying to do too much um there's everything that's just another variable and you're adding these more things and trying to get all that to balance and be cohesive uh just becomes more and more difficult so oh ryan just stole my screen maybe i don't know i was trying to i want to go oh there it is i wanted to show people tom oh yeah that's tom nickel right there yeah so yeah, and it's on. Uh, he's on Dan's shirt as well. And, you know, and so the only thing, I, what I really want to add, I mean, Nathan covered it really, really well. What I want to add was that what it really came down to when we were getting ready to develop a gin was the question was, are we going to make a traditional London dry style or are we going to make a new Western style? And you know, over the last several years, the gin industry, the gin category has exploded. I mean, it's really, it's really grown, and a lot of that growth has been, or maybe all of that growth has been. Uh, has been uh, from the addition of all these new Western gins. And that's an, that's an actual category now that people recognize. Um, and the new Western gin doesn't really adhere to a specific uh, flavor profile that's juniper dominant. And in, in London dry gin, uh, by definition, it has to be juniper forward. You have to taste that juniper. And a lot of the new Western gins just don't. And they get really creative. They get you know, they'll throw in some floral elements. They'll throw in a whole bunch of different, a lot of them are very, very citrusy. Some of them to me taste more like citrus vodka than, than actual gin because the, the juniper is so low and the citrus is so high. Um, but, but like Nathan said, our goal was we wanted to make sure that this gin works in cocktails. And I know, you know, as, as a bartender, somebody, somebody sits in my bar and wants a Negroni or a Martini or a Tom Collins or a gin tonic, I'm going to reach for Tanqueray or Plymouth or Beefeater, the traditional classic London dry gins, because those drinks were built from that flavor profile. And while, while some of those new Western gins, like uh, Nathan described, are really well made um, and they, they can be really delicious, they don't always work in those, in those classic cocktail recipes. So we felt like it was the best choice for us to try and make the best London dry style gin in the United States. And that wasn't something that anybody really had stake to claim to. You know, everyone was trying to, to, everyone was asking themselves, how can we be different? How do we do something that's different and unique um, and a departure from the rest? And we asked ourselves, how do we make the best London dry gin? How do we replace Tanqueray in the US? And I know that's a bold claim, um, but it's really something that, that we set out to do. And it's an easy transition for, um, you know, for consumers to switch from their, their you know, go-to standard like Tanqueray or Beefeater or whatever and switch to this because it's gonna be very familiar. Um, in fact, we source all five of our botanicals from Tom Nichols' uh, sources in Europe, uh, the same sources that he used to get uh, his botanicals for uh, Tanqueray. And he also formulated Tanqueray number 10, which is the most uh, award-winning uh, gin in history. The guy is a, a legend and nobody knows making that style of gin uh, better, better than him. I'll also add that the distillate, you know, contributes a lot to that as well. You know, we see a lot of, um, 
you know, that sort of like new Western style, that modern style gin that we see coming out of the United States a lot using a corn distillate. Whereas wheat gives it a very different flavor profile, a very different canvas to build off of. Yeah, I think uh, I think the the thing is, that's really an important uh, thing to point out. Um, our our belief is, and and mostly influenced by Tom, really is that when it comes to neutral grain spirit, nothing is better than wheat. You know, as far as he was concerned, you know, you you can't make a gin with anything other than than wheat as your your neutral base. Um, prior to our our gin, we were making vodka already, and we were using corn. Um, and so in our minds, we were thinking, you know, why not just use the same base because it, it would be easier, you know, as far as uh, acquiring the neutral grain spirit, not, you know, trying to complicate our production uh, methods and everything. But when it came to a, a question of quality, it was a no brainer that we were going to have to use. We were going to source the best uh, quality wheat neutral spirit as possible for uh, for this and maybe Nathan can add something to this as well because it does absolutely have an impact but um, Tom was very adamant about uh, sourcing the the wheat as the, the NGS and actually I think we tested several different ones if I remember correctly that he had to vet them before we decided what we were going to use. Yeah we te we ta we've tasted several and I've I've constantly I mean if someone says hey I've got this like wheat uh, neutral spirit that I like you should try to use I'm open to tasting anything, but even just in the wheat neutral spirit realm, there are a lot that even though they meet the, the category for like, yeah, this is a neutral, um, it is to me, it's not completely neutral and it still has some sort of characteristic. And one of the big goals, and Tom and I've talked, uh, you kind of want a vehicle to be the presentation for the botanicals and wheat has this softness to it. And so, uh, that combined with uh, uh, the copper distillation that we're doing, and you end up with what is, at least as far as we can see, like the perfect vehicle to present uh, the botanicals that we are doing. And so that's why we do what we do. Um, so. Awesome. Well, let's, in the interest of time, I could talk about gin all day, <laughs> for sure. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the whiskey the Kansas City whiskey, and I also want to make sure that we touch a little bit on your distillation of um, the new whiskeys that are coming down the pipeline in the next few years, just to manage expectations years. Yeah, no, I'd like to, I'd like to touch on that as well, absolutely. So real quickly, one of the, probably the first person we actually brought into the company before, uh, before we were even a real company yet, and we, before we released our product was Dave Pickerel. Um, I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with Dave. Um, that's him on the, the left. Um, that's me and him when we purchased our first 100 barrels of light corn whiskey from the MGPI distillery in uh, Indiana. We went down there and uh, uh, I had to, we had to see our babies, see our, our first uh, 100 barrels of whiskey at the time. Purchasing 100 barrels of whiskey uh, felt pretty good. Uh, that was pretty, pretty amazing. But Dave was uh, an integral part in the development of our company and, and our brand and figuring out what to do, figuring out how to build a distillery, figuring out how to source barrels and, and products and, and all of those things. He was absolutely uh, vital um, to that process. And, you know, he became, he became family in, in, in that process as well. Um, but when we did this, when we first resurrected the brand, um, we knew we knew a couple of things. We knew that we wanted to resurrect the brand with a whiskey right out of the gate. So not a vodka, not a gin, but we wanted to be identified first and foremost as a whiskey producer um, because that's really what we were mostly known for back uh, in the pre-prohibition era. Um, the problem with that is if you're going to make you know straight bourbon, straight rye uh, from scratch from grain, you're looking at four or five years before you'd have a product at the market, and we weren't we didn't have the ability. Uh, to do that. And we weren't going to cut any corners with our production. We weren't going to use small barrels. We weren't going to release anything at less than two years old or four years old, even for that matter. Um, so we weren't willing to, to rush the product to market. So we were going to wait. So the other way to, to go about that is to source. So we started by um, sourcing barrels of whiskey from uh, a, a couple different places initially. Um, this product, these barrels here, the light corn whiskey, ended up becoming the, the vehicle for what is our Kansas City whiskey. Um, initially, it, it was something that I really didn't know much about. And it's actually a, a category of American whiskey that it's not really so different from bourbon. Uh, in fact, the mash bill on the light corn whiskey is the exact same as the mash bill on our bourbon that goes into the blend. There's only two differences. 
One difference is that uh, in bourbon production, you cannot distill it to over 160 proof during distillation in order to retain more flavor. Uh, light corn whiskey does break that threshold. It's distilled to about 165. And then second, instead of being aged in new charred oak barrels, it's aged in second use barrels. Um, so it's just, it has a very, very close similarity to bourbon, but it's not quite as aggressive. It's not quite as robust. It's like a softer, uh, friendlier version, put it that way. Um, but it's delicious. And so we tasted it and I was like, wow, this is really incredible. Um, and they had a lot of it at a reasonable price. Like, yeah, let's go with this. So we ended up blending this um, with uh, straight bourbon as well. Um, I'll go to the next one here. So this has the breakdown of our uh, blend that's in our bottle. Um, we blend in seven-year-old straight bourbon. Um, same, again, the same mash bill as the light corn whiskey and then five-year straight rye from Alberta. We uh, sourced our rye uh, initially from the same distillery in, in Canada where uh, uh, Pick was uh, using uh, for Whistle Pig. Uh, so the same, same whiskey. But then what really sets us apart is that in digging into the history of American whiskey production, it turns out that it was very, very common to blend sherry into American whiskey. That was a very widespread practice. And we have a whole nother seminar that we do just on this subject alone. And we could talk for hours about it and really get into it. Uh, Cause it's very interesting, it's very complex, but blending sherry or adding sherry to American whiskey was a, a common practice back then that really has been long lost and forgotten. And so this is the style of whiskey that we decided to resurrect instead of just making a, you know, a light corn whiskey by itself or a rye or bourbon. Uh, this allowed us to do something that was both innovative by today's standards, but also a real nice tribute to the history of American whiskey during a time when we were thriving originally. Um, so what we did was uh, another person we brought on board was Steve Olson. I don't have a picture of him here, uh, but I'm sure a lot of you know Steve. Uh, Steve is a, an icon in the industry and an old friend of mine. Uh, he's widely considered one of the best uh, sherry experts in the world. And so when I discovered this and we decided to do this, I reached out to him. Next thing I know, we were on our way to uh, Jerez de la Frontera in Spain to source sherry. And we ended up selecting a 15 year Oloroso sherry from Williams and Humbert uh, in Jerez. It's a gorgeous uh, winery. It's a fantastic sherry uh, in its own right. I mean, I would drink it by itself all, all day. It's not like a bulk, you know, cooking sherry. I mean, we're talking really, really good stuff. It's a, it's a wonderful wine. And we add just 2% of that to our final, uh, final blend. So, um, you got all the details right there, right in front of you, what's in the bottle. If you're, if you happen to be tasting it, uh, like I am, <laughs> uh, even at 2% sherry, the difference is remarkable. And we do a, a breakdown seminar. We do a component tasting where we extrapolate all these ingredients out and you get to taste each one individually. So at cask strength, each one of the three whiskeys, and then taste all three of those whiskeys blended together pre uh, sherry and then post sherry and that 2% sherry just changes it entirely and you might notice right on the nose you're going to get some of that nuttiness right away it's the first thing I always smell um, when I smell our whiskey it's just it's so unique and so distinctive you get that nuttiness from the from the Oloroso um, and then on the palate up front to me it's all bourbon and corn uh, it's very uh, indicative of, of those whiskeys on the uh, on the front of it. And then mid palate, you get that richness and sweetness again from the sherry. Um, you get some of that dried fruit characteristic and butterscotch and maple. Uh, it's really delicious. And then the rye kind of comes on in the end. It, it's that spiciness from the rye that kind of balances it all out um, and makes it really, really special. Um, you know, the, fi the, the final thing about this is the Kansas City whiskey on the label. When we submitted this recipe to the TTB back in 2014, they initially rejected it and they said that we could not add sherry to American whiskey. Um, and they were clearly wrong. And it's actually in their own guidebook. It's in their legal descriptions. And it's very small. It's like one half of a page, half of a paragraph of one page um, in a, you know, uh, beverage alcohol manual that's like over a thousand pages. And nobody's done it, you know, since prior to prohibition. And so they didn't know that it was allowed, but it does clearly state that due to established trade practice, um, up to two and a half percent sherry is allowed to be blended into um, American whiskey. And so they were kind of taken aback by that and were like, all right, well, I guess you can, you can call it, you can blend in sherry, um, but there was no category for it and there was no way to classify it. And since we were resurrecting this distillery, 
uh, after 95 years and since nobody, no one else was doing this particular uh, style of, of historic uh, American whiskey, we were allowed to classify it as Kansas City whiskey by uh, the TTB. It's pretty dope. Pretty dope. <laughs> and I, but I think in terms of like, we talked a little bit about the versatility of the gin. Like there's a lot of versatility in this whiskey too. Like some whiskeys I'll take and I'll be like, okay, this is a wintertime whiskey that I want to use in this way. Or I'll be like, this is a summertime one that I want to mix with this kind of spirit and I want to bring out these tasting notes. And this is one that I can draw that nutty flavor from the sherry in a really beautiful way that highlights a very Christmassy sense. Or I can do the same thing in the summertime that is very bright and beautiful. And it's a, it's a really fun whiskey to play with from a cocktail sense, or if I'm just hanging out in my office and just drinking it. <laughs> you you know? know, we we went to really uh, painstaking lengths to dial in the the amounts of each whiskey uh, and the amount of sherry. I think we tested everything as low as 1% sherry up to 2.5% um, and uh, played around with the, the ratio of light corn and bourbon and rye and all that, and even different proofs, as high as 100 proof, down to I think uh, 86 was as low as we tested it. Um, and then we also conducted multiple tasting panels, blind tasting panels with experts in the industry, as well as I even took, I, I took samples of uh, test batches to Tales of the Cocktail and uh, you know tested on bartending friends of mine in the industry. And we did uh, cocktail experiments and tried to see if, you know what worked best in cocktails. And that's how we ended up dialing in this specific recipe and also dialing it into 92 proof. And it was absolutely uh, imperative that it worked well in cocktails. Like you said, it had to be versatile. It had to be a good sipping whiskey, uh, but also something that would make a really great, you know, old fashioned or um, our favorite horse feather, you know, all those things. So all, everything was taken, in, taken into consideration. We spent a lot of time uh, making sure that it, it hit all those, uh, hit all those notes. So then let's, I want, I also want to acknowledge that it is, five o'clock central and we said this was going to be an hour and I think we're going to go for probably another 10 minutes because I want to make sure that we do touch on especially since we have Nathan with us the um the production of the whiskeys that you have coming out and I want to take a moment to explore the still the column still that you have yeah I screwed up I thought I, I walked over uh, I was over by the barrels. <laughs> so I was I, right. look at, like, so I went over to the Rick house so you guys could see that. But uh, hold on. I'll go quick. But I wanted to I, I, I was gonna try to point out we have barrels that we just barreled uh, two days ago. So we have some rye whiskey that we just barreled. And so you um, you barrel in fifty three gallon barrels. Correct. Where are you sourcing your barrels from? Uh, Independent save. Um, so they <laughs> They, uh, they're actually, the Coopers that we're getting them from, they have a couple in, in America, one in Lebanon, Kentucky, and one in Lebanon, Missouri. Uh, and Lebanon, Missouri is close to Springfield, Missouri, if you guys are familiar uh, with that geography, but it's also, it's two and a half hours south of us. So it makes perfect sense for us to get barrels from there. And I could really go into detail about why Ozarks Oak and White American Oak is the best you can get uh, to hold liquid. But we can we can say that for another, another hour long time. Glass that I, that's another raising a glass that I definitely want to happen because so, I'm here for that. Okay, the mash mash ton, uh, 2,500 gallon capacity is what we're currently working on, um, and then we have five fermenters. This is I'm, I could never be a weatherman. Uh, <laughs> so we have our five fermenters uh, here. Uh, they're all open top fermenters. Uh, that's tradition. That's what you're going to see if you go anywhere in Kentucky. You're going to see that. Um, it's, it's real simple. Uh, makes it easy to clean. Uh, this taller one right here is the beer well. Uh, that has a, a mixer on top of it that allows us to mix uh, the ferment, fermented mash. And then we'll actually pump it into... Jesus. This is... So, I, I feel like I'm doing so bad. Uh, doing pump great. it into our column still. So our column still... If you go to some some of the big guys, you know, like oh, that's a that tiny little comp still, but it's like the perfect size for us. It's exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, so this allows us to take that 2,500 gallons uh, in about an eight-hour shift, uh, and then turn that into our low wines, which we will then 
redistill in Sherry, our original whiskey still. Uh, there's a condensate return pump that is currently going. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yeah. It'll 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 shut off in a second. Uh, no, we can hear you. But, uh, th then we can do a secondary uh, distillation in here uh, and make our heads and tails cuts and, and end up with what will go into a barrel. The reason we did it that way, and that's different than uh, most other distilleries, they will have it run directly from a column and they'll go into a pot or a small pot called a doubler or a thumper. Um, and you do that, that, that cleans it up a little bit, but it doesn't allow the flexibility that we have by doing a, an entire second distillation. And so that allows us to make it a little, like just a little bit cleaner. And it's a, an idea that Dave and I talked about multiple times. He's like, you know, if you want the extra pain in the ass of this, it's gonna make a better whiskey. And I thought, well, like we can do, like we should do it. If, we're, if, if, it, if it will allow us to make something that we feel is gonna be a better whiskey, why on earth would we not wanna do that? And so uh, that's why we, we run it the way that we currently run it. And so um, we're able to take, we have, sorry. Um, so the rye whiskey that we just finished making, uh, we actually just finished up a campaign of rye whiskey. We're gonna switch to another one. Uh, we're gonna make some of that light corn whiskey like Ryan was talking about. Um, but we've just done four months of, uh, actually since January 1, yeah, we, we've been running rye, uh, a rye whiskey. But doing a high rye, so 96% rye, 4% malted barley. I was, I was over in the barrel warehouse. I was gonna point it out to you guys and show you what it was. Uh, but actually that's just barrels sitting there so that's not that exciting but um we wanted high rye monongahela style rye something with spice spice forward uh that would definitely work in you know, your, your classic cocktails um uh, and we're i think we're getting so much closer to that very first rye that we started to distill here when we very first started up to it actually being ready to release we haven't determined any release dates for that but um we're getting really excited about it. It's getting better and better every time we sample it. Another whiskey that uh, we are really looking forward to having come out is our bourbon. Um, and so right now we have our Kansas City whiskey that has a bourbon component, but the bourbon that we are going to release out is gonna be a high rye bourbon. Uh, so it's, uh, it is 30% rye, 56% corn and 14% malted barley. So a lot of uh, rye in that bourbon. It's still classic bourbon characteristic and that malt comes in, it's got a nice kind of grainy uh, note to it. So those are both coming along. We've got stuff that if we wanted to, right now, today, we could release bottled and bond bourbon and bottled and bond rye. But uh, I think we're all really stubborn about making sure we wait until it's exactly right. It's, it is exactly what it's supposed to be and it's, it's perfect. So I would imagine, you know, within the next year, I would be surprised if we don't have something out. Uh, and I, we, uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself in, in saying that specifically, but um, some of the the rye, the last time I got to, to sample it, it was uh, coming along perfectly. It's doing exactly what it's we wanted delicious. it to do. It's almost like Dave knew what he was talking about when he told us how to make whiskey uh, and told us what to do with Weird. it. So uh, yeah. it's, it, for, for me, that's one of the, like, I would get sentimental maybe a little bit. Um, I got I to taste new make whiskey with that guy, and he taught me everything I know about all this. But man, I like not getting a chance to taste. And maybe it's oh, man, I'm, oh, I'm gonna get emotional here. Think about. It. Okay, I am excited about those. Those are our babies. We've been putting them away. It, it's been a huge deal. We've been doing this for you know five years. We this mm -hmm. is like and we've just been constantly putting it away and doing everything we can. And so to get it to see come to fruition. Uh, I think we're all really excited about. I'll, I'll pause there. I, I love it. Um, so I do have a question that I wanted to ask and Monique actually asked a question in the Q&A. So she said, but what does it mean when someone says that vodka is distilled 11 times, like 11 times through there? And I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the column still that you have, because I think that there's a little bit of a misconception that column stills are for stripping whereas pot stills are for, you know, full and lush spirits. So like a column still is for a vodka where you don't want to taste anything. And that's not necessarily true. And I think that looking at your column still, which is this, you know, beautiful little baby, as opposed to like these monolith, massive, you know, like stories high, stills that are made for like 95% type stuff. Can you speak a little bit to the difference 
and what you're looking yeah. for, how you can manipulate yeah. and everything? No, I would, uh, yeah. Um, so I can kind of, I can point out maybe just some of the structure on our column still. And then a lot of times when you're talking about, uh, when people talk about column distillation, mm -hmm. two of the big like schools talking about that would be if you have a Scotch whiskey producer and they, they, they think of a column still, they are thinking of a coffee still. And that's something that was going to distill something to very close to neutral spirit. Mm -hmm. It's going to strip away almost all the flavor that you're wanting for. But in America, almost every bourbon you guys have ever had mm -hmm. was made on a column still. Even if, like, even if it finishes on a pot still, but like, think of all the big producers. Yeah. Uh, you like Jim Beam, uh, Heaven Hill, uh, like all, like they're they're making it on a column still. They're making it on a slightly different type of column still that is designed specifically to only distill it to a certain proof. And so, um, try to point these guys out. So, this is so, okay. The beer, so uh, when it gets pumped in, it actually goes in right there and it trickles down all through here. Um, and in that, that's where it's just interacting with the steam. Um, so, when it comes off of this still, it is only 110, 115 proof. So it's still got, every bit of all like all the congeners all that flavor essentially that you're, you're going to want to pull off from the fermentation it's got every bit of it it's got so much it's got a ton of character you get a column still to make vodka you're gonna have multiple columns of multiple trays and it's going to take it from this fermentation to you know 95.6 like just right up there and strip off all the flavors it's a lot it, it's a lot different than what this is um, but that, that's why, like, I think, that, like, in, in Europe, they talk about column distillation, but they're not thinking about the still that you would see if you went to Jim Beam. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about the still that they would see or use to make, like, a grain whiskey that would go into blending. Because uh, even when I talked to Tom about this, because earlier in his career, he used a column still, uh, but he was making kind of the high-proof whiskey that was going to go into a blended scotch. Um, and so what we're doing is it's designed more for throughput uh, to be able to keep a lot of the flavor, uh, but not, uh, you, so you're not. Oh, no. Sorry. I was, we're I back. Phone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, so there's, there's generally like two, like, for everything I've looked at and, and it's people like kind of arguing, but they're talking about the same thing. Um, cause you can say like, oh, a pot still has more flavor. Sure. But a column still can have the same flavor if you do it in a different way than you did. Like, so it's not apples and oranges. There's mm -hmm. just different ways to do it. And so it, it's, it's a more complex answer than just like, this is better than this. Uh, cause you can, the way you design it all is like, it can make, uh, what you want to, but you design a column still to only distill to 120 proof. That's just it's very, very, very similar to what you would get if you had a pot still and you wanted to distill to 120 proof. And I it's think not it's not magic, very... all the things that are happening, uh, they're like, it's, it, it is, it's just what can boil off and what's gonna come out. So it's still the same sort of stuff chemically. Um, it's just, I can put through uh, on this still, you know, we, we can go at five gallons a minute continuously. And then I can make my secondary distillation uh, or on a pot still, I can do, uh, on this one, we used to just do 750 gallons in the entire shift uh, and get a very, very, very similar uh, flavor. So I hope that makes sense. I, I think it does. And folks... I, um, I blacked out for a second. <laughs> um, folks, feel free to chime in if you, um, if you want any, any of this, because now we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty of distillation. Because in the column still, you have all of those different plates. And every time it passes through a plate, that's a different distillation. So what happens is it turns into vapor, and then it recovers. I'm actually going to interrupt you. Can I interrupt you real quick? Absolutely. Yeah, so I don't know if I can even show you. Can you see? Yes. Uh, so, no, I think so you I these, So hey, all of these bottom trays. Mm -hmm. Going up to, we have three trays that are like the trays that you're talking about, Laura, mm -hmm. or 
of the trays that are on here are bubble trays. So, so are those, the, are, th those are different yeah. than each of these trays here. They're called sieve trays. And what they are is imagine you have a flattened out colander. And so what it's designed is to kind of, uh, it's really, it's just slowing this fermented mash because it gets pumped in up there and it's going to fall down. What they're doing is kind of slowing it and, and extending the time that they are interacting with the steam, if that makes sense. So that's kind of the, the design around that. And then above, on the top three, which you can sort of see there, those top three is where it's not the grain or anything like that that is, uh-oh, I'm out of focus. Okay. I thought I just uh, had too much whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's where uh, the liquid would interact. And then if I can, I can't really do it and, and let you see. It's so hard to see inside a still with a camera. I've tried to take pictures all the time yeah. and it feels like it's very disappointing. But in these trays here, they are specifically designed to concentrate the alcohol. So these are like the bubble trays that you, that Laura, you're, you're the mentioning. The ones that like, have the bubbles on top yep. of it. Yeah, so it's a flat tray with a, a it's kind of a, a lip or a hole with a lip on it. And then a cap over that lip. Mm -hmm. And you can't, uh, I don't know if you guys can see, it's kind of, they're kind of splashing there on those windows. So a lot of times when people talk about, hey, our vodka is still blank times, whatever, seven, 14, it doesn't like however many times. What you would say, and it's defensible to say, is each time it goes from vapor to liquid, that is the distillation. And, I would argue that it's defensible, but it's also misleading on purpose. So in our still, we have actually, set, if I, I could walk through and I could point out seven different points where it converts from paper to liquid. And so I can say, oh, every time it passes through this still, it is seven times the still. But I think that's, that's misleading. And so we try to be pretty open about that and kind of talk about it. Um, the TTB, they, they care a lot about a lot of verbiage on your labels. But as far as I know, we could say 20 times distilled and they're not going to check that. They, they, and there's no way they can check that. And so it's not like a real thing. It's like, that's, that's more into the marketing fluff kind of aspect of it. Um, Cause they'd also don't check how many times something's filtered. Triple filtered, quadruple filtered. Well, I mean, that's that it goes in the same area of, that's the fluff it, it it is actually it's just there for a marketing purpose people will do it and not brag about it for flavor purposes but uh the adding it on a label or things like that that doesn't uh no one's checking that and there, there's honestly no way to guarantee there is it is a triple filtered uh quintuple distilled whatever it is if that makes sense for a lot of things uh, you get into like uh, uh, pot distilled, like Scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey. Yes, those are going through actual, like simple Alembic pot stills, and they are going through their multiple distillation. But uh, so I can speak maybe more to American whiskey and things, American distillates and things like that, because I'm, I'm not dealing specifically with a lot of the restrictions that uh, they would have on their labels. I am familiar with it, but like, yeah, I, I'm speaking more towards uh, America when I talk about that, if that makes sense. It, it does. And I would even argue with your gin still with that little onion top there that creates a little bit of reflux going in. So it's going to give it even more body and more of that like yeah. rusticity. Almost. That, and then, yeah. And then in, in between those two flanges, we pump cold water in there specifically if I could get a good video of it uh, to make it rain down. And so it's actually yeah, raining exactly. down liquid through the vapor. Uh, and yes, so if we wanted to we'd say, yeah, it's this many times distilled. But the whole point of it is for flavor. It's, it has nothing to do with like being able to say our gin is blank times distilled. But yeah, yes, you are right. So for folks tuning in, folks tuning in, the the shape of the still and not just the method of distillation, but the actual shape of the still has a profound impact on how the flavor is imparted, how it's integrating into itself, and like refluxing back in as it raises up. So there's this constant dynamic happening and what column stills do is really capitalize on that um that duality 
Um, and I think that your production floor is a really great example to learn about that. Yeah. Um, we are over and I apologize. I was like, I'm going to be under 16 minutes like a boss. Um, <laughs> psych. Um, are there any other questions before we log off and enjoy our weekends? That's not me trying to be like, no questions. Like if you have questions, now's the time. I'm going to give it 10, nine, eight. But as someone might be furiously typing, I just want to thank you all, Ryan, Nathan, Ryan, Nathan, Erica, my sweet Roni, Dan, thank you for being a bouncer. Um, I hope this was helpful for you folks for tuning in. I certainly learned a lot. Um, I always learn from these folks, but yeah. Um, thank you for being great partners and, you know, being a part of this right now especially <laughs> i know we're early proponents of the raising a class series so thank you very much um a few things then before we beautiful thank you a few things before we log off upcoming next tuesday we have yeah buddy <laughs> we have um calvin out of new york my counterpart out of new york um talking with uh, Fortaleza, Tequila Fortaleza. I will 100%, even though it's not one of my brands, I'm gonna tune into that. Um, and then next Friday, Dan and I are gonna be switcheroonying. We're gonna be switching it up and he will be interviewing G4 Tequila and I will be playing bouncer. Um, and then after that, we have Virginia Distilling. We have um, some of the cremes from BCI coming up. A lot of great stuff down the pipeline. Um, also, as you log off, you're going to see a screen that's like, do you want to take the survey? And I'm going to say, yes, you do want to take the survey. Give us feedback about how this went. Um, it's really helpful for us because if you're like, this was too long and I hate Flora, we need to know that. <laughs> so I can have my Friday nights off. I'm kidding. Um, kind of. But yo, <laughs> thank you. Take the survey. Take the survey, says Flora forever. Thank you so much for... Um, participating with us and tuning in everybody thank you Wimbo. that was awesome thank you Bye, thank you thank all you so much for coming in and listening to me yammer on for a, however long i did on all, the all day so. all nathan's day. specialty yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. no i love it thank you all right have a good night everybody gonna end bye guys bye